for to share the screen and uh, we'll uh, progress on here. Okay. All right, you can see the screen. Yes, okay, perfect. All right, cool. So we left off last time with uh, basically this diagram here. Um, and we were kind of joking, it looks like ET, uh, but the idea that you have corpus uh, spongiosum, which stays spongy or collapsible uh, so that the urethra is not shut off. And then you have the corpus cavernosa, which is a more cavernous body, um, which is going to be filled with blood. And uh, so I had you write down those two guys and that was about it for that diagram. So the one I'm gonna show you next is gonna be the one that you're more likely to see on a test because it's a cross section uh, of not just the penis, but also the internal uh, anatomy as well, which is, which is quite a bit uh, more interesting, especially from a physiology point of view. Uh, so that's probably your worksheet number two uh, that you have, if you have that handy. And uh, so here's the things you should, you should know. Oh, hold on, let's see. Um, yeah, green, I don't think I've written in green yet. Um, so everything that, you know, sticks out of the uh, pelvic cavity, if you will, um, is all the body, right? There's a body and a root. Uh, the root is actually like, I guess it would be interior or deep to, uh, you know, where, where the skin is essentially. Um, that's the part that's embedded in the pelvic cavity. And then the body is the part that's outside of, of the pelvic cavity. Here's the best way to say that. The urethra is a term you already know from last chapter. Uh, the urethra is this tube that transports both uh, semen and urine um, through the penis. The glans penis is the same thing as the head of the penis. And so that's uh, the anatomical term for the head uh, compared to the shaft, right? Those are two different uh, places. Um, obviously, penis is not something I would ask you to label. I think you pretty much know what that is. If not, holy moly. Um, a testis is singular, testes is plural. Uh, the testis has a huge surface area. This side over here is a testis cut in half, and it's filled with these itty bitty, teeny tiny little tubes that are kind of all squiggly on the inside. And all of those teeny tiny tubes provide a massive surface area for the production of sperm. Sperms produced in the testis, and the sperm cells will work their way up into this little mohawk structure on the top. And that's called the epididymis. I'm trying my best to underline without striking through words. Uh, the epididymis essentially stores sperm cells um, until they're ready to be uh, ejaculated and uh, tries to keep the sperm cells at the correct temperature so that they don't die and that kind of stuff. And the testes are creating sperm cells all of the time. Um, somewhere between 270 and 300 million is the target per ejaculate in, you know, average Joe, if you will. Okay, uh, we've already talked about uh, the, if you know root, I don't care so much that you know bulb or cruise, that, that doesn't bother me, don't worry about those. But one I do want you to note is the bulbo gland. A hard word to spell, but does kind of make sense. Uh, the bulb on the urethra, like look at the thing, right? I mean, come on, here's the urethra, the tube that carries urine and semen. And then there's a little round projection that comes off the urethra. So bulbo urethral, the bulb on the urethra is actually a pretty good term, a pretty logical term for that particular gland. Um, we'll go through the glands one by one, but essentially they're all doing uh, the same thing, uh, which that's a little bit of an oversimplification, but not too much. Um, they're all adding basic compounds so that the sperm cells aren't killed by the acidic vagina, or they're adding fructose, which is a simple sugar that give the sperm cells energy so that they can swim. Because basically all a sperm cell is, is a head with DNA, tons of mitochondria, and a long tail called a flagellum. And his job is to swim, 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 and beat the other 269,999,999 sperm, because there's going to be one winner and so many losers. And so the tail just needs to swim very quickly, as John can tell us from the great sperm race. It's a sprint. Okay. So um, that's the bulbar urethral gland. The ejaculatory duct is a, tr is a tricky term, basically. And this is, this is something that I think kind of, I don't know if, if it feels like we're splitting hairs here a little bit. There's, there's three, I guess there's three tubes, essentially, right? Um, when you first come out of the testy, that's not true, testis, whatever. When you first come out of the testis, you're in what's called the vas deferens, okay? As the vas deferens runs through the seminal vesicles, the prostate gland, 
we are mixing these basic fluids to turn sperm into semen. So once you're at the point where you can kind of call this business semen, we change the name from vas deferens to ejaculatory duct. Now the ejaculatory duct, once it hits about the root of the penis, is then called the urethra. But you're in the same, like, it's, it's like calling it Haynes Avenue and Fifth Street. You didn't leave the road. You're on the same road. You're in the same tube. It just has three different names at three different locations. So I guess take that for what it's worth. If you know that the vas deferens leads to the urethra, I'm more than content with that. Um, if, if you don't know, like, well, where's the division between vas deferens or ejaculatory duct? Probably not going to change your life. Okay, don't, don't worry about that. All right, vas deferens is a tube that leaves a testis, and the urethra is a tube that gets it out of the body. The in between there is running through a bunch of glands. Now, the glands I would like you to know because the glands are very important. Uh, this first guy here is called the seminal vesicle. Uh, again, a pretty simple name because the goal is to turn these sperm cells into semen because they are different things. And so the first, uh, I guess it would be, how should we say this? The first major addition of basic fluids that really makes sperm cells into the solution called semen comes from the seminal vesicle. I think that's a decent way to say that. And so the seminal vesicle adds this basic compounds, the sperm cells hit those basic compounds, and then they run through the prostate gland, okay? The prostate gland does much the same, adds more basic compounds, and continues the addition of this stuff. Uh, for making the sperm cells basically able to swim, essentially, is the goal. And uh, honestly, that's about it. Like, it's, it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, here's the urinary bladder, pardon me, from last chapter. Here's the ureters coming down in the urinary bladder from last chapter. And, and that's about it. I mean, as far as the, the guys are concerned, it's really not that terribly complicated, honestly. Uh, testis makes sperm cells, sperm cells to epididymis. Um, upon ejaculation, the epididymis uh, pushes those sperm cells up the vas deferens, and then we get solution added through the seminal vesicle prostate gland, and then the sperm cells with the new solution there, and we can now call semen, and they're off and swimming, and that's about it. It's a pretty straightforward design. Uh, questions over any of those things? Because we're going to do the glands one at a time. And that's, that's about it for the guys. Can you go back a slide real quick? Back a slide? I can go yeah. back a slide, yeah. Okay, thank you. I want to make sure I have everything. Yeah, hey, no problem. Okay, um, let's see. So, uh, cross-section of the testis. These are kind of cool. Um, it's, <laughs> it's, it's weird. Right, but it's cool. I mean, come on. So the testes produce sperm cells, um, and they also have interstitial cells. Uh, interstitial cells are very important because interstitial cells are going to make testosterone for the guys. Uh, there's spaces between the seminiferous tubules where the interstitial cells lie. And so basically, let's see, I could draw this without messing it up. I believe in here are interstitial cells that are making testosterone. These tubes are making sperm cells. There we go. That's not too bad. And that's essentially the goal here. Now, these tubes twist and twirl all throughout the testis. Bear in mind, this is just a cross section. This is a two-dimensional picture of this. So throughout this, I, 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 I want to say sphere, but I don't know how spherical it is. Throughout this oblong egg-shaped circle, oval thing, these tubes are everywhere. So, I mean, there's a lot of, of square footage, if you will, of tubes. And if you take one tube, this teeny, teeny, tiny tube right here, and you cut them in half, and you look in a microscope, what you would find is almost disturbingly like skin. If you recall the basement membrane, big skin grows like corn, basal, spinosum, lucidum, blah, 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 you know, up to the epidermis. You have a very similar kind of design here, where you have... Uh, your interstitial cells, and then in this lumen of these little teeny tiny tubes called seminiferous tubules, the seminiferous tubules have a basement membrane, and they have immature cells that can become sperm cells. When hormones hit them, called follicle-stimulating hormone, which says go forth and become a sperm cell, and they will mature into sperm cells. And there's always new cells going through mitosis. 
making new cells that will become sperm cells. Just like your skin started at the basement membrane, mitosis, 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 pushed the older cells up and they died and sloughed off as your uh, stratum corneum, right? These guys, <coughs> pardon me, the basement membrane, mitosis, 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 the cells go up, up, up. Then they get hit with a hormone called FSH and those cells grow a tail, put an acrosome on the head and start to swim down the tube. <coughs> All roads lead to the epididymis. So the tiny tube they swim down is this guy right up here, this goofy little mohawk called the epididymis. And those are the sperm cells who are ready to swim. So uh, the takeaway from this cell, uh, this cell, huh, I've said cell so many times, sorry. The takeaway from this slide, if you know that seminiferous tubules are the tiny tubes in a testis, <coughs> you're going to be in great shape. Uh, if you know the epididymis is this goofy little mohawk, you're going to be in great shape. Here, they've kind of put him like over here, I guess. That's okay. That's fine. Um, and then the vas deferens, the tube that leads up out of the testis, um, is how we get these little guys out of there. Because if they stay there, there will be no babies. Okay. Um, let's see. That's, that's it. Yeah, that's it. Does that kind of make sense? How the cells grow a lot like the skin cells? Cool. All right, cool. Got a couple of head nods. I'm happy with that. So let's move on. Um, some more basic physiology stuff here. Spermatogenic cells, not something I expect you to spell on a test or anything like that. They line the seminiferous tubules and produce sperm. No duh. Those cells are undifferentiated until about the age of 10 years old. Sure, there's going to be variation in person to person, obviously, but it's not surprising to you that they mature right before puberty, right? That's when, I mean, you know, uh, you know, a four-year-old kid is not producing actively swimming sperm cells, right? He has all the cells needed to do so, but until he hits puberty and starts to produce LH and FSH, luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone in increasing levels, he's not producing any sperm cells, just like young young girls aren't ovulating any eggs. It's the same thing, right? This is all hormonally regulated. So whenever this kiddo hits puberty and the FSH and LH levels increase, then the testes start producing actively swimming sperm cells. And, you know, they're off to the races, if you will. Seminiferous tubules we've already talked about. Convoluted, you guys just got done with the urinary system. So you're like, I know convoluted, you know. Uh, the little twisty, twirly, unnecessarily complex tube. That's about it. Pretty straightforward. I do see a couple people writing, so I'm going to be patient. I don't want to click too quickly. Yeah. Feel good about it? Almost. Almost. All right. I don't have any cool stories to tell you. It's weird to just sit while he writes. I do have one cool story. When we're done with class, at the end of our 30 minute mark, you can log off if you want. But if you want to stay, I'll show you a surprise. Okay? It's really cool. Promise. I think it's cool. You might think it's boring, but I think it's cool. So we'll see. You'll know in 10 minutes or so. All right, Mr. John, you good? Yes. Yeah. Cool, man. Cool. Thank you. All right, here we go. Let's see. Um, I think now that's all repetition. Uh, internal accessory organs means they're inside the body. No duh. Epididymis inside the body. Vas deferens inside the body. Seminal vesicle. That's this big guy here. Prostate gland. That's this guy here. Full urethral glands. We've already got those. We're, we're done with those. We did that. Okay, cool. Uh, so let's see. In the epididymis, you have immature sperm. They're super tightly coiled in the epididymis on the outer surface of the testis and connects your seminiferous tubules to your, uh, your uh, vas deferens. So the vas deferens is a muscular tube that passes through the inguinal canal. You might recall the inguinal canal from when we labeled body regions. Uh, there was inguinal region, right? Um, and so the inguinal canal is a little canal that the testes actually originally descended through right before this little guy was going to be born. And um, then the sperm cells move from the testis, epididymis, epididymis, vas deferens. And so these slides are just taking you step by step. Uh, once they hit the seminal vesicle, we can technically call it an ejaculatory duct. The ejaculatory duct is going to pass into the urethra and then out of the body. So it's that, it's that, that diagram in words 
but it's pretty simple to follow the trail and figure out where it's going to lead to, right? Not that complicated. Uh, so let's talk seminal vesicles. Because I told you before, like these guys are important. Like they're making a huge contribution to turning sperm cells uh, into semen. And that, that's a pretty uh, important job. So uh, they're attached to the vas deferens. Obviously they kind of lead in, there's an on-ramp here. Here's your seminal vesicle. So the things that they produce go here. These sperm cells go here. Uh, they kind of merge onto this interstate of the prostate gland and are becoming semen. Uh, they're secreting an alkaline fluid, which means it's basic, uh, which is not new to you. I've already told you that. And they also secrete fructose. Fructose is a simple sugar that is easily, easily, easily broken down into glucose and used to fuel the many, many, many mitochondria in the sperm cells because the goal is to swim faster than everybody else. So you are going to be burning through glucose in your mitochondria to make tons of ATP to swim to the egg before all the other sperm cells swim to the egg. And so that's uh, the importance of that. Uh, they do secrete some prostaglandins, which you might recall as a local hormone. They're a hormone that just regulates things locally. So that's kind of a fascinating point. And then obviously they lead just further down this tube, which we can call ejaculatory duct if you like. So if you're taking notes, just write seminal vesicle, equals basic plus fructose and you will be in fantastic shape basic and fructose and that's really all i all i think a person needs to know about that all right seminal vesicle so let's go to the next gland down the prostate gland probably the only reproductive gland that you've frequently heard about on television um, it, I don't, I don't watch TV, but when I used to like five or six years ago, all the time, there were these commercials that were like, did you know one in three men will have BPH and here's this drug or here's this test or here's this whatever. And it's like a dad and his two sons. One of us is going to have an inflamed prostate kids, you know, and they're like, Oh no, we'll have to stop our golf game to pee every five minutes. And we'll frustratedly sit there and wait for those three drops of relief until we have to pee in the next five minutes. And that's the sadness of an enlarged prostate. Yikes. Good news, girls. You have a 0% chance of having inflamed prostate issues or prostate cancer. Who would have thought? Because you have no prostate. Yeah, okay. So anyways, guys, however, one in three. So look out. Anyways, so why do we have this goofy little prostate gland? Well, the prostate gland empties its contents into the urethra and it secretes a fluid that helps make semen. And as you might have guessed, it's alkaline or a basic pH. Again, we're not surprised by this probably. The secretion is supposed to enhance the fluid mobility, uh, which basically means, let's see, how should we say this? Uh, maybe not so thick, maybe a little more watery semen so that the semen can make it further uh, to its final destination, which would be a fallopian tube. And the sperm cells can't swim if the medium they're in is too thick, uh, but if it's thinner, they can swim a little bit better. And so that's an important thing. Uh, there is a smooth muscle in the prostate gland, so it can contract a little bit and uh, empty those alkaline secretions into the urethra. Now, the reason it's on television with the benign prostatic hyperplasia ads and, and help granddad enjoy his car ride more ads is essentially as you get older, it can become inflamed or swollen. Now. When it gets bigger and swells, which might not be a surprise to you, the urethra runs through the prostate. So if the urethra is running through the prostate and the prostate becomes swollen, it is going to pinch that urethra shut. So sadly, grandpa really does have to pee and he really does have a full bladder. But when the detrusor muscle contracts and the external sphincter on the bladder relaxes, his urine is trying to flow through a tube where just a little bit further down the prostate gland is forcing the urethra shut. So sadly, he does strain for those three drops of relief, but his bladder's not emptied. So he feels like he has to pee again in another five minutes. And I, I don't know, I assume it's very annoying. I don't know, I have a 30% chance. I'll let you know in 20 years or 30 years. Just give me a call. Oh. No, I'm not gonna let you know. Gosh, don't be weird. Okay, anyways, so uh, are we done with that? Prostate gland? Yeah. Okay, cool, prostate gland. Anatomy, it's the best. All right. Bulbourethral gland, the teeny tiny bulb thing off of the urethra. Uh, again, it is inferior to the prostate gland. Well, no duh. You can it's below the pro yeah, okay, you can see. Um, it secretes a mucus-like fluid, and essentially that's gonna be released uh, in response to sexual stimulation. 
prior to ejaculation. That's going to come out. Okay. So do with that information what you will. Uh, females have an analogous feature as well, but that's before the production and release of semen. That's a bulbar urethral gland. So that's pretty much what that thing does. There we go. Okay, what do we have here? Poster review. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, that's it. Yeah. Expect this diagram on your test. Expect some little blanks of the worksheet. It's pretty straightforward. Um, make sperm cells, make them basic, feed them fructose, get them out of the body, and that's it. That's pretty simple. So any questions over that diagram or those organs or anything like that? Do we need both diagrams or just this one? I, I prefer this one. The other diagrams, the cross section, and I didn't even put blanks on it. I thought it was helpful, but I would say this one is, uh, I, I like this one better for a test for sure. So put a little star on this one. Okay. All right, cool. Go once, go twice, three times, sold for no questions. All right. Were any of you guys on the enrichment day when I went to Omdahl Ranch with me? No, darn it, that's too bad. It's the only time I've ever had a field trip that you know had something to do with semen. They sold semen sticks from bowls in giant tanks of liquid nitrogen, and it was cool. Like they like opened it and like pulled these long plastic rods out, and they're like, "This is worth like however many dollars," and it holds like a hundred of these. And I was just like, "This is so weird, but kind of cool." And uh, and then there were puppies, so you know, pretty good day all in all. All right. So, anyways, <laughs> semen. What's in semen? Well, uh, sperm cells. Duh. I don't, <laughs> come on. That's a silly question. Um, also, all the secretions that came from the seminal vesicles and the prostate gland and the bulbourethral gland. Again, kind of no duh. Uh, semen is slightly alkaline, pH is 7.5. We've already mentioned that. It has to be basic because it's going into an acidic environment. You've heard that like three times. Moving on. There are some localized hormones. I don't think you have to commit that to memory. Uh, really, I wouldn't. Uh, there are some nutrients, which we already talked about being mainly fructose, to fuel those sperm cells to swim. And about 250 million sperm cells per ejaculation. The numbers that I've heard are 270 million to 300 million. But it does beg the question, who in the world is counting this? Because that is a large number. Uh, but anyways, whatever. That's, you know, uh, you only need one. So I guess that's, it's, uh, it's a, how should we say this? It's a quality over quantity thing, if that kind of makes sense. When a female ovulates an egg, it's gonna be a pretty good egg. Three of the cells have died, one cell has survived. You only get one a month and it's gonna be a pretty high quality egg. When guys produce sperm cells, if some have two tails or no tails or misformed tails, it doesn't really matter because they're gonna make 250 to 300 million of them. So the guys vote for quantity, the girls vote for quality, and we're all alive, so I guess it works okay. Uh, here's a sperm cell. He's a pretty simple little guy. He's got a long whip-like tail called a flagellum, and he's got a head with half of dad's DNA in that nucleus. That's about it. He does have a cool structure on the top of the head called an acrosome, which has enzymes that will dissolve the outer membrane of the egg to let that sperm cell nucleus get into the egg. And then by some miracle that I don't claim to understand, after one sperm cell nucleus gets in an egg, even if a hundred sperm cells have surrounded this egg at the same time, when one nucleus of the winning sperm cell gets into that egg, the outer layer of that egg will become hard and it won't let any other sperm cells in. It only lets one in because you get half your genes from mom and half your genes from dad. So one sperm, one egg, and you've got a complete set of chromosomes. One egg and two sperm get in, you've got an extra half a set, and that's going to be fatal in humans 100% of the time. I shouldn't say 100%. It's not going to work. So that's a pretty cool, that's a pretty cool feature there for sure. Uh, let's see. Guys produce sperm continually throughout the reproductive life. Guys really don't have like a much of a menopause equivalent, right? Like women hit an age where they're done ovulating. There's no more eggs coming out. That's called menopause. And so there's no more baby making after that, which I think is probably why Sarah laughed and Abraham didn't with God's promise. Cause she's like, I stopped having eggs a long time ago, dude. But guys can produce sperm pretty much until they kick the bucket, which is why Abraham maybe wasn't laughing. Cause he's like, yeah, I could see that happening. Maybe um, I don't know if he, 
knew any of this, but you know, there you have it. Uh, so guys produce sperm throughout their reproductive life. Uh, when they're actually in the testes, they're not swimming around. When they get mixed in with the secretions from seminal vesicle and the prostate gland, it kind of feeds them the sugar and turns on the tails and they're off and swimming. We don't know how this works because they have no eyes or brain or noses. But if you take a viable human egg and you put it in a Petri dish and you take sperm cells and you put them in the Petri dish, they know where the egg is. They don't randomly swim and bump into walls. Like they turn to the egg and it's a race. And, but I, you know, I don't, I don't know how that works. I don't know if anybody knows how that works. Some people think there's a chemical the egg releases that they can sense. But I'm like, it's just a nucleus with a tail. How did, what? what, what, what? Uh, anyways, so they, you know, I mean, they, they do a good job. They get the job done, right? Uh, the ability to fertilize an egg is called capacitation. Uh, capacitation is basically weakening the membrane around an egg so that the nucleus can get in there. And, and that's about it. Um, we'll look at that next time because there's a little structure called an acrosome on there uh, that allows it to do that. But it is 930. So we are like so close to being done with the guys. All we have to do is physiology for the guys, which is pretty straightforward and we're done. So we'll finish up the guys on Monday and we'll jump in 